In the first two instalments of this 30-year history, we've watched 12 engineers in a barn take a groundbreaking idea and turn it into a success by the end of the 90s. We've watched that grow through the 90s into a global organisation with the capability of leading the industry and creating new markets. As ARM moved into the 2010s, new challenges were waiting. Challenges the company would prove more than ready to meet. To help us track that story, I'm enlisting the help of my friend and colleague, Brian Fuller. Erstwhile reporter of the tech industry, both reporter and maker of news, and now ARM's editor-in-chief. He's the perfect companion for the final stage of our journey. Hello, Brian. Hello, Chris, from the palatial cafeteria at Arm San Jose. How are you, buddy? Ah, oh, well, I am in Arm Cambridge's wonderful library. So uh, look, last 10 years, 2010 onwards, can you just sum up that decade? Mind-blowing, acceleration and expansion. Think back to just before the last 10 years, 2007, the smartphone really started to come into its own, right? So that expanded in the decade of the 2010s because the phone became not a phone, right? It became an essential tool thanks to the sensors in it, positioning, cameras, all the software and apps that the ecosystem built around it, plus the compute efficiency that's inherent in the ARM architecture that allowed these things to last for hours and hours and hours. Now, one of my favorite anecdotes is around 2012, I was driving across the California, Arizona desert. And I realized that at that time, the Austrian daredevil Felix Baumgartner was jumping out of space in a capsule down to earth. So I thought, hey, I'd like to see if I can see that on my smartphone. And sure enough, going through the desert, on cellular network at 70 miles an hour, I watched that thing. But it occurred to me at that moment that the future of computing was gonna be almost unimaginably cool. So I, where are you right now, by the way? Because by the look of the background, you're not in Arm San Jose. No, we're about 25 minutes away in Los Gatos. So Brian, take us back. Where did Arm first plant the flag in America? So technically, Chris, the first ARM US office in the Silicon Valley was in Tim O'Donnell's back bedroom up on Skyline Boulevard above Los Gatos. Tim was the first ARM US president. But the first real corporate facility was right behind me, 985 University Avenue in Los Gatos, uh, where the company began to rapidly expand. And people tell me the story that there was another cool little startup they were trying to figure out back then called Netflix that shared space in the building. They weren't sure what that business model was all about, but the good news is obviously over the intervening decades, both Arm and Netflix have been very successful companies. You also mentioned expansion. So expansion of the business, how did that turn out? They started to look at areas where the power efficient compute story uh, could play big time, right? And one of those areas was in the infrastructure. The company started, I think, as early as 2012, looking into how we could apply ARM compute, ARM Cortex processing power into the infrastructure. Flash forward 10 years, and now, today, ARM is in the Fugaku supercomputer, the fastest supercomputer in the world, and not surprisingly, also one of the most green or energy efficient. So that was one area uh, where after a lot of hard work and innovation, um, Arm started to make a dent in, in that market. Where else has Arm expanded in that decade? Well, laptops are, are one as well. And there, there was a lot of effort put into sort of disrupting that space with power efficient computing. Why? Because throughout the 2010s, more laptops got into more hands of people all around the world, and they don't want to be tethered to an electrical source, right? So they need long battery power. And so that's exactly where the ARM technology um, started to make headway in things like Windows RT, uh, which was based on the ARM v7 architecture. I also see that you have moved location again 
and um, you are now somewhere in downtown San Jose. Where is that? Another example of expansion. If we were together, we'd be working here for a time at the San Jose McHenry Convention Center, where Armed Dev Summit is held, at least during face-to-face -face times, live. Now, afterwards, you and I would wander down the street into downtown San Jose. We'd have a pint, celebrate. So why is this important? Well, key to the ARM technology story is the notion of our ARM ecosystem, which is global in scope. And so that's nurtured for years and years and years by ARM TechCon, our developer conference. Now, that started out in the Santa Clara Convention Center, but over time, we expanded out of that space. And so a couple of years ago, we moved the event here downtown San Jose and it was rechristened Arm Dev Summit a couple of years ago and it's really an unparalleled combination of hardware and software tracks experts from around the world that you can't find anywhere else in our industry. I also see changes Brian in the way that people access computing because we see things like voice interface it, it, it's kind of everywhere now it is Arm in that too? Yes are you surprised? I mean Think about um, what we now take for granted, but which really, to me, sort of came out of nowhere a few years ago, voice-activated devices like Amazon Echo. Those devices have to be on and aware, but drawing very, very little power because most of the time it's not hearing anything, but it wants to hear my voice. Once it does, it's got to wake up like that, got to get to work really, really fast. And so ARM distributed compute technology in those devices has enabled that. By the way, did I tell you 842 ARM-based chips are shipped every second? There's some number that blows my mind. But don't we start to run into kind of security and privacy issues? We're all shopping online, we're banking online, we're talking to our microwaves, we're carrying a phone around with us everywhere. Just how big is that security privacy problem? Are we talking dollars here? <sighs> lots of dollars with many, many zeros. So it, it's estimated, for instance, that this year, cybercrime will bite $6 trillion out of the global economy. T trillion dollars, that's a lot of money, right? In the next four or five years, it's forecast to grow to $10.5 trillion. So we started working with the ecosystem to build more holistic solutions for security. This has yielded uh, organizations like PSA certified in the attestation and certification business, right? So you can take your, your chip, you can take your system, have it PSA certified that it meets all these security guidelines. So, you know, the ecosystem can breathe a big sigh of relief there. Now, also over time, we're working relentlessly at the device level on the IP side to compartmentalize really important parts of the system so that mischief makers uh, can't slide in there. This year, we took it to the next level with ARM Confidential Compute Architecture, which has this notion of realms where even trusted data, your trusted data, could be banking information, could be anything, can be computed on outside of interface with the operating system. Um, so it adds another layer of security to the device level. Artificial intelligence and machine learning. Where's ARM on that one? Everywhere. Is that a good enough answer? Everywhere? Um, almost everywhere. I don't want to be flip about it, but we talk about inference learning of all these artificial intelligence models, right? A lot of that's being done in the cloud on the learning side, but for years now, innovators have pushed more and more artificial intelligence out to the edge and the endpoints, right? Well, they've been doing it on ARM CPUs. Cortex-A, for instance. So we did a survey a couple of years ago. The vast majority of engineers at the time were actually delivering machine learning inference on ARM processors at the edge. Now, they're also using graphics processors, neural processors, NPUs, as we call them as well. Um, and they're, they're dialing in, depending on their application, um, the right balance of processing power to do that most efficiently heterogeneous compute is what we call it internally. And it's really delivering some amazing applications and will for the foreseeable future. 
if the last 10 years are any indication, we can't even be able to guess what kind of technology is going to be enabled through this ecosystem in the next 10 years. I mean, it's really going to be mind-blowing, and I'm pretty excited about it. Just remind me once more, how many chips per second? 842 chips per second. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. It's mind-boggling. <laughs> It's fantastic. Thank you so much, Brian, for helping us to tell the story. And I'll meet up with you again in 10 years' time, and we'll tell the next installment. Here's Thanks. to that, Chris. Thank you. We've been on a long journey together through ARM's history. But from a processor, 12 engineers, and a barn, to the globe-spanning company that we know today has taken just 30 years. I'm very proud to have been a small part of that story and it's been a joy to share it with you. I hope you've enjoyed the journey.